corporations. This is one of a keyword for entrepreneurs and for startups on how to manage, how to create, manage, grow their business. But what is a corporation? Corporations are definitely very ingenious mechanism. And they are quite recent. So the first corporations appeared some centuries ago. And the reason why they appeared was exactly to steer business opportunities. This was a period which, which we can define as one of the first moment, one of the first time that the world became really globalized. Of course, not as much as we are globalized today, but this was the early stage of international trade. This was also the beginning of international trade theories. So we are uh, roughly 400 years ago, primarily in Great Britain, uh, with, with a few other European countries who was leading this uh, business initiatives. In uh, Great Britain, as well as the Netherlands, Spain, so all these countries had uh, colonies uh, all over the world, and we start trading and the trading was done as you can see here in this slide was done primarily by ships and ships had to navigate the oceans in dangers for thousands of miles and so the problem was how can we ensure that we can sail smoothly and that we are able to reach our destination. And if you think of it, this is exactly the same challenge that entrepreneurs have today. And entrepreneurs is exploring, just like the merchants back in 16th, 17th century were exploring. The entrepreneur in his exploration would like to say smoothly, and how can he or she do so? And the answer to this is incorporation, as it was back uh, 400 years ago. Corporation were set up to address the risk. For merchants to send their trades, their goods, their merchandise, literally in the other side of the world, so they created companies they invested in the capital of a company and by doing so, they protected themselves in case of a very likely disruption along the route. So, of course, back then, the vessels that were rather fragile compared to modern vessels, it was common for them to face some typhoon or some storms and then to sink. And of course, when the vessel sank, so then all the merchandise was gone as well. So how to ensure protection against this? Company, a corporation. What are the key features? What are the key benefits of a corporation? The first one is that the corporation is a legal entity, and we can even say more than just legal entity, we can define it as a juristic person. Juristic, legal, not a breathing individual, but still a person. So this is a nice analogy. A company is like a person. A company can basically do whatever a person can do, well, except marrying. Okay, a company cannot get wet, but other than this, a company can do exactly everything that a person can do. And this is the, one of the major benefits of corporation. This is how um, trade was initially fostered. What we are going to see in this video is how to use corporation, how to exploit the advantages, the power of corporation. Then we will get a bit more into details into different type of legal entities 
and we will use common law legal system as an example for a few reasons. One reason is that common law legal system is the legal system of the wealthiest, most advanced economies and thereby is kind of setting the standard that also to other economies. Other reasons is that many of the economies that here in Thailand we, we deal with in terms of company establishment, of course America, but also Singapore, also Hong Kong, are common law legal system. Final point, specifically coming to the Thai example, even though Thailand is a civil law country, interestingly, the disciplines of legal entities was taken from the common law legal system. So the principles of legal entities in Thailand are to some extent more similar to the common law legal system rather than the civil law legal system. The final part of the video, this will be more into startup corporate law for entrepreneurs. How entrepreneurs in America, but also here in Southeast Asia, can set up a company. What are some tricks that entrepreneurs should be aware of to make the most out of their um, experience with laws and legislation? So without further ado, let, let's now jump into the video. Let me give you first this nice quote from Ambrose Pierce in the Davis Dictionary. The definition of corporation, which I, I really find uh, fascinating, is an ingenious device for obtaining profit without individual responsibility. And, and definitely this is a, a nice way to capture the accents of corporation. But let's see a bit more in detail what is the power of corporations. So <clears throat> one key feature, which I already mentioned, is that corporations are juristic persons, meaning that they can do whatever a person can do. They can hire people, they can make contracts and so on and so forth. However, they are not a person. And when you as an entrepreneur, you invest and create a company, then you will be a shareholder, meaning you own a piece of the capital of a company. The capital of companies generally divided into shares. That's why the definition shareholder. However, as a, as a shareholder of a company, you are not individually responsible. You are not individually liable. Other advantages of corporations. One is a tax advantage. So generally, corporations have a lower income tax for corporate tax compared to individuals. You never see income tax for corporation go up to 35, 40%, 50% and so on. Generally, could be around like 20%. In some jurisdictions, would be lower than that, 10% and so on. And besides this, companies are able to deduct expenses, meaning that some expenses that are important for the company growth can be deducted in their form all these expenses, as long as they are in line with what the company does with the business of a company. So not all expenses would be deducted, but most of expenses, as long as we are in line with the business can be deducted, which means that differently from individuals, the taxation of a company will happen only on the profit, the final line of um, the statement of a company, the bottom line of a statement. So the company will have <coughs> the revenues, we have the expenses, then the profit and the taxation will happen on the profits. So you can find here on the right hand side of this slide, this adaptation from Robert Kiyosaki, even though it's not an academic, uh, um, it's not an academic figure, but I think gives you quite powerfully the idea on the difference between an income statement of a company and a personal income statement. So as you can see, the income statement of a company will of course start from the revenues, so the cash flow in generated by the revenues of a company, and then there will be the expenses. And only after the expenses, profits 
if there is any, will be generated and the taxation will happen on the profits. And as you can see, this is different from the personal income statement. Personal income statement of a person that is employed, for example. So what a person that is employed would do, would earn money, would pay the taxes, and then will have expenses. With a key differentiation here is that you pay taxes on your income and you do not deduct any expense. So, of course, this is key feature of corporation, by the way, legal feature of corporation to reduce taxation. Other benefits, asset protection. So, of course, when you have a company, you operate a business under a company name, your personal asset won't be mixed with the business asset. So you have your own home, you have your own car, you have your own clothes, your own devices. These are your own personal assets. And then there will be the assets that the company owns, the office, the factory, the equipment, the tools, and so on and so forth. Separated, they're not mixed together, which means if a company goes bankrupt because there are some business disruption happening, there is some economic crisis, only the asset of a company will be taken over by the creditors, for example, the banks, but your own personal asset won't. Your own personal asset will stay with you. Additionally, a company has a structured governance. What a structured governance means is the rules, the responsibility, the duties of the people in a company. So generally in a company, you will have a board of directors, a BOD, you will have uh, all the chief executive officers, um, so all the C-suit of, of a company. You will have auditors, so that are the people that are controlling that the company is managed properly and so on and so forth. So you have all this governance, all this complicated mechanism that as an individual you can't have. Final point is protection from a lawsuit. Of course, every lawsuit related to business will be dealt by your company, not by you personally. And for entrepreneurs, especially for innovation entrepreneurs, it's very important to have access to investment as well. A company just give you this, access to investment, the opportunity to access investments. Why? Investors won't give money to an individual personally because it's too risky. However, investors will give money to a company owned by an individual. They will take a minority stake in the company and this would protect their investment as well. So still on this point, just an additional clarification on the difference between an entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs with corporation and employees who work for a corporation. So the entrepreneurs will earn, will spend, or even better, the company, his company will earn, will spend, and at the end will pay taxes. But for employees, any employee from factory workers up to a CEO, the, em the employee will earn first, then will pay the taxes on the income, and then will spend what is left after the taxation. Let's now get more into the details of different type of companies. And as I said, we look at common law system for, for the reason that I mentioned. And by the way, these are also the type of companies which we can find in Thailand as well. However, I will uh, introduce also more specifically all the types of legal entities in Thailand in a few minutes. So just a very high level overview. What are the type of entities that we find in common law legal systems in America, UK, Hong Kong, Singapore primarily, and Australia as well. So sole trader, which is the simplest and the commonest form of business structure, and this is generally for a very small shop, very small enterprise. Then we have a partnership. Partnership is 
it requires at least two members. The partnership is a typical business form for accountants, solicitors, basically lawyers, architects, and so on. So professionals that are um, delivering uh, professional services. Among partnership, we also have a special category, which is the limited liability partnership. Meaning that this partnership has a legal entity which is separate from its members. So, in, to an extent, this limited liability partnership does have some of the benefits of a company. Then we have companies. We differentiate two main types of companies. One is the LTD, the limited liability company. You will, you will find that it's called sometimes with the abbreviation LTD, sometimes with LLC, limited liability company, and so on. So all of them uh, refer to the same concept anyway. What is a limited liability company? It's a separate legal entity, which is fully independent from the owners, owners that we call shareholders. And this is the most appropriate vehicle to balance, to manage the risk. That's why entrepreneurial ventures will go through limited liability company. Final type of company is the public limited company. Public limited company is a limited liability company, but it's like the upgrade, the premium version of a limited liability company because this is the company whose shares can be sold to the general public, to retail investors, to us, via the stock market, the stock exchange. So when a startup, after being successful, after reaching a certain scale, after receiving all the different series of investment up to like series E and so on, it's big enough to become a public company, which we call this process as IPO, Initial Public Offering. So in this moment, the company will shift from being a limited liability company to become a public limited liability company or PLC. Okay, let's now see some of the features of each of these companies. So <clears throat> companies or more generally, more broadly entities. So the first is the sole trader, which is single individual, ownership and management are the same. This entity is personally responsible for all the debts, meaning that between the entity doing the business and the owner, there is no separation, there is no wall. So if you have debt as a business, you have also debt as individual. If your business go bankrupt, you also will be held responsible. And so the creditors can come, knock at your door and ask you to repay back. Generally, this is for shops, for freelancers, and does have confidential information, confidential financials and so on. So you don't need to disclose any information. Partnership. Partnership is typically used by professional uh, for professional services, should have minimally two members up to 20. Also normal partnership means that partners are jointly liable for all the debt of a business. Generally, there is a partnership agreement that will govern all the formalities in the partnership. The upgraded, the premium version of a partnership is the limited liability partnership. As we said, this is a legal entity that is separate from the members, which means that the limited partners won't be responsible for the debt of their partnership. The only one <coughs> that will bear the responsibility is the general partner or managing partner and also the LLP will be registered in the registrar of companies. Then the LTD, the limited liability company, 
separate legal entity must be registered with the registrar of companies in any jurisdiction where is this company registrar. It, 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 it has different names depending on the legal system, but anyway, you will find this type of office basically in every country. The company does have a company number, which is the number that used for the registration. Generally, there is a, a no minimum share capital or a very limited uh, share capital and shareholders are not responsible for corporate debt. Premium upgraded version of a private, li private limited company is the public limited company, which is a company whose trade are uh, whose shares are traded on the stock exchange, must have at least two shareholders, two directors, must have a qualified company secretary, uh, ensuring that everyone, everything is in compliance with the law, does have a minimum authorized share capital, and we receive a trading certificate from register of companies. So let's take a look now, what are the type of business organizations in Thailand, keep in mind that Thailand borrowed many of the principles from the common law legal system. So many of this um, concept would be similar to what we just examined to up to now. So the first one will be the sole proprietorship. The sole proprietorship is an unincorporated business, which is owned by one person, and again, in this case, all the asset of a sole proprietor, both the business and the personal asset are subject to legal action. So there is no limitation of liability. Under the Thai civil and commercial law, there are also three types of partnership, the general partnership, the registered ordinary partnership, and the limited partnership with limited liability. Keep in mind that partnerships are not that often utilized in Thailand because it's so much easier to actually set up a company. So generally, either people will conduct a business as sole proprietors or they will uh, register a company. And this uh, leads to the third category. Limited company in Thailand would be abbreviated as COLTD, Company Limited. So this is very similar to the, the American and the British firms we have just analyzed with shareholders liability, which is limited to the extent of their shares, meaning that the liability of shareholders is limited to what shareholders invested in the company. If you invested 100, you will be liable for 100. If you invested 50, you will be liable for 50. If you invested 10, you will be liable for 10. And also in Thailand, there is a public limited company, companies listed on the stock exchange following the regulations set forth by the Public Limited Company Act of 1992, with the securities that are traded on the stock exchange of Thailand, and they also follow the additional regulations set forth by the Thai Security and Exchange Commission. The Security and Exchange Commission, again, this is an authority that you can find in every country is the authority which vigilates and controls that uh, everything on the stock exchange happens in a lawful way. So they avoid that there would be some companies, some traders exploiting for their own advantages uh, the stock exchange. The last topic that I would like to introduce, and in, in this is literally some tricks for startup owners on how to incorporate their entrepreneurial venture, and especially to do so by being able to get investment and also all the advantages coming from, uh, from having a corporation. So first, we are going to see how to do this in America? What is the typical way to do this in the United States? There is a typical process to incorporate startup and to attract investors. This process and comes from almost 70 years experience in America with venture catalysts. We know that VC were established after the Second World War, so in America there is a long experience on, on this. 
is the establishment of a C-type, abbreviated as C-Corp. C-type corporation, and particularly this corporation that gives some additional benefits and rights, are set up in Delaware. Delaware is one of the states in the United States. It's essentially, to put it, to, to put it simple, is the tax heaven of the United States. So when you hear the American government complaining that there are some tax havens globally that charge very little uh, tax rates, it's because the United States do have their own tax haven within the United States, which is Delaware. And of course, they don't like so much competition coming from the other tax havens. So <clears throat> why Delaware? Why C Corp? Why Delaware? One point very strong is the great expertise of Delaware and specifically the special courts of Delaware, the court of chancery on corporate matters. So Delaware really has hundreds of legal precedents on corporations. So there are courts that are extremely specialized on this matter. To give you some figure, more than 50% of publicly traded company in the US in more than 60% of Fortune 500 companies, which are the biggest companies worldwide, are incorporated in Delaware. What are some other advantages? Tax optimization. We know already that a company gives tax advantages. However, a C Corp in Delaware gives more tax advantages than a normal company. What are these tax advantages? One, which is a key feature, is that if a company is registered in Delaware, but it operates in another state, which is generally the case because Delaware is a small state, so generally you incorporate your company there for investment, for legal reasons, but then you operate in other states in the US, for example, California, which is home to most innovative businesses, this company incorporated in Delaware won't pay any corporate tax in Delaware and will pay if the tax is only in the state where they are operating, for example, could be in California. Other key point is that Delaware allows to maintain absolute confidentiality on the structure, the governance, the shareholders of a company, and so on. This is a key point, especially for investors, because if you are a venture capitalist, you probably don't want your name to be publicly disclosed when you are making a very early stage investment. So you would like to keep it private, and this is possible in, in Delaware. And this leads to the final point. So Delaware is actually the common standard for investors. So all corporate lawyers, venture capitalists, investment bankers are familiar with Delaware legislation. A few more data here. In 2019, almost 90% of the new IPOs, the new initial public offering companies going on the stock exchange were undertaken by Delaware C corporation. And the rule is that essentially most venture capitalist firms will only invest in Delaware C corporation for many reasons. The most important reason is that there are some stocks, some class of stock or, or shares, stock or shares is exactly the same, same meaning, that give special rights to the founder and to investors. So you know when you let venture capitalists invest in the company, you are giving out pieces of the equity, pieces of your capital. And if you are the entrepreneur, then you will be reluctant to give more than 50% of your company to other investors because then you can't control the company any longer. Solution here, coming from the Delaware legislation is that you can own founder shares with special voting rights in the general meeting 
which is a meeting that every year, every year happens, uh, mandatory, must happen in the company. So with these special shares, you have more voting rights. So even though you may own 30% of a company, you may have in the meeting voting rights that go up to 50 or 60% of the capital. So this is a way for you to give out more capital to investors, but at the same time, you retain the voting rights that you need to control the general meeting. Why you want to control the general meeting? Because in the general meeting is that the body in a company that will appoint the directors of the company, that will approve the financial statement of a company and so on and so forth. So if you have your majority there, then you can control uh, all the other bodies, all the other um, areas of a company. So this leads to final question, which is as entrepreneurs in Thailand, but also in other emerging economies, is a challenge, a typical challenge is how can you have access to capital? And you see that even in the most advanced economy in America, investors require startup companies to set up their legal holding, the you know, like the legal head of a business to be in Delaware. We don't want California, we don't want um any other state, they want Delaware. And so imagine for startup founders in emerging economies, this is even a more pressing issues. So how can you create and foster and grow your entrepreneurial venture in Thailand? So a good option here, a good trick is to follow the exact same concept of America, maybe with some additional layers uh, so probably, you know, the structure will be less lean and agile than in America, because in America you can have, you know, your Delaware corporation and then you can also do business in all the other states because it's, it's a federal state, right? So you, you are still in the United States. Here, maybe you need to clearly set up a double company structure. So you have a company which carries out the operations in Thailand, business as usual in Thailand, and then you have a company specifically for investment. So have a company for dealing with venture capitalists, for receiving investment from venture capitalists and so on. So what you can do, so this double company structure can be done with the United States. You can do a C-Corp in Delaware and then with a C-Corp in Delaware, where you receive a funding from venture capitalists, then you can own the company in Thailand. Or you can do this with what we call as a GBA, which is essentially the area of Hong Kong and Shenzhen. So again, here it's to get investors and you will get two types of investors here, international investors and Chinese venture capitalists. So you can set up your company in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is common law system. So uh, this will be again, a jurisdiction that international investors will like very much. And then with your Hong Kong company, you will either operate in Thailand or most likely you will need to set up a Thai legal entity to conduct your business, everyday business in Thailand. You can also do the same with Singapore. Again, Singapore common law system uh, with a lot of international investors, legal entity, your head, your legal head for investment and so on in Singapore and then operational company in, uh, in Thailand. There are also other options and this depends on the type of investment you're looking at and the type of product that your startup is building. So if your startup is more into a manufacturing type of product, so maybe in this case you may want to work with countries that are stronger in manufacturing, where you can also find investors that are more focused on manufacturing. In this could be the case of having a company in China, then operating the business, controlling a business here in Thailand. 
could be the same of having a company listed in Paris, uh, well, not listed, established, no, not, not time yet to go on IPO, established in Paris, in France, in Frankfurt or in Milan, so France, Germany, Italy, so all of this, especially Germany, Italy, are very strong in manufacturing industrials. So if this is your focus, so not like digital, but more into like product, um, like industrial product manufacturing type of uh, startup. So this could be also a good combination. And of course, another uh, good combination could be London. So London is also a financial uh, international financial market. So probably um, for the purpose, only for the purpose of financial investments. So Hong Kong and Singapore would make much more sense in here in Southeast Asia, but London can also be a possibility. However, and I will leave you with this final uh, food for thoughts. When you do this, when you set up a, a company internationally to gauge investment and so on, and when you operate a business in Thailand, then you also will become a foreigner because company will be a foreign company. In thereby, there will be some sort of limitations uh, which are under the Foreign Business Act of Thailand. I won't go into details here, but the bottom line is that properly arranging, properly organizing all the legal structure of your startup is one of the key features that will steer in the long run the success of your business. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye!